So next we'll talk about uh, social neuroeconomics. And to give you an introduction, I'd first like to discuss the social brain hypothesis. So here's an assumption that's commonly made in economics and specifically in economic models of rational choice. This is uh, a quote from Bruno Frey uh, around 1970, where he said that the agent of economic theory is rational and selfish and his tastes do not change. And this is basically a description of the homo economicus, which is stating that people are profit oriented and selfish. And it's an approximation or a model human being that is commonly used as a simplifying assumption in economic models. And we all know from behavioral economics that that assumption is not true, but it, it remains a standard assumption because it helps to simplify things when it comes to mathematically modeling and making predictions. But let's take this apart in, uh, in the next couple of slides. So let's first consider whether the agent of economic theory is rational, in fact. And uh, to consider this, I'm putting up this um, two by two matrix here from camera that plots the dimensions of neural functioning. We have cognitive and effective processes, and we also have controlled and automatic processes. It could be argued first that automatic processes are outside of the uh, rational domain. They're the things that we don't even uh, take notice of uh, and that our brain takes care of for free in a sense. Uh, those are things like, for instance, breathing, heart rate, and most of visual perception. Um, so that, I would say, is excluded from the domain of, of rational decision making. And so are effective processes, which are maybe the drivers of many of the biases that we observe. So both um, automatic and effective processes might influence and drive our decisions in, in some sense, but they're not in the domain of um, what we would consider rational decision making. I would say that that is mostly in the domain of controlled and cognitive processes. So, well, most of economic theory thereby considers only one quadrant uh, of neural functioning and, and cognitive processing, whereas it ignores effective and automatic processes. Now, this obviously is not entirely true, and there are studies that look at automatic processes. There are studies that look effective processes, such as emotions. Um, but based on this uh, definition here, I would say that the rational aspect is only the first quadrant, but there's so much more that the brain takes care of and that the brain can do other than rational decision making, and it is obviously obviously important for our choices. Next, let's consider um, whether our tastes change or not. One of the um, findings in, in psychology and other sciences and social sciences is that our tastes indeed do change across the lifespan, for instance. So obviously uh, we have different concerns when we're older than when we were younger. And so our preferences do change across the lifespan. So do our personalities and so does our brain. So, um, well, this is, this is obviously an assumption that is incorrect. Um, additionally, we can see from the uh, drift diffusion model that tastes can change even at a shorter time scale. So when it comes uh, to uh, the course of multiple decisions that follow each other, uh, there's some noise in this process, there's stochasticity in this process, and this stochasticity can lead, for instance, to decision errors, but it can also change our preferences depending on where we direct attention. So this is part of the attentional drift diffusion model. Or when we're under uh, time pressure, we might not often choose or not always choose um, what we actually do prefer and just, well, basically accept less evidence uh, for one option versus another option um, as good enough and thereby make decision mistakes. So tastes can change. Finally, um, the assumption is that we are selfish or that the agent of economic theory is selfish. And this is obviously also not true. So we can even look into our ancestors uh, who are performing in this grooming here. Um, people and even our ancestors like uh, chimps and, and apes and monkeys, they, they help each other, they assist each other. And there's a lot of evidence for this as well in the literature that there is helping behavior um, already in our close ancestors. Nowadays, this type of grooming um, might be likened to uh, a Facebook like, but obviously our um, so our social behavior and our helping behavior goes far beyond these simple types of things and uh, much further. 
in addition to these little anecdotes that we're not entirely selfish that I mentioned earlier, uh, social neuroscience also tells a whole different story. And this is basically packaged in the social brain hypothesis, uh, which started with this book here, uh, The Machiavellian Intelligence um, by Andrew Whiten and Richard Byrne. And the idea behind this is that um, humans started living in groups because they don't have much to offer in terms of defending against predators by themselves. But in a group, this is a whole different story. So in a group, we can coordinate defense. We can also coordinate hunting. So hunting successes um, became larger and defense against predators uh, became better through living in group. So in a group, basically, each individual member of this group had uh, an increased chance of survival and living a longer and better life. However, living in group comes along with some challenges, as you might imagine. There might be competition amongst uh, uh, different group members for the food that was then finally um, found or, or gathered. There might be competition for, for sexual mates, um, for reproduction. There might also be competition for shelter and status. And so the idea behind the social brain hypothesis is that as we started to live in groups, our brain started developing to basically accommodate these novel uh, social challenges that came along by living in groups. So now all of a sudden we had to remember hierarchies um, and we had to find some machinery to outsmart others. And this is basically what evolved by living in groups. So the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, or the social brain hypothesis, if you will, is stating that brains grew to develop cognitive machinery to outsmart others. Um, and this is what we kind of see here when we look at um, the brain sizes, the absolute brain sizes, across different species. So we have already some social behavior here that we see in the hedgehog, which has a relatively small brain. We can see that uh, this mother here uh, exhibits maternal behavior. As we then move uh, sort of closer to us in terms of our ancestry, namely chimpanzees, which share much of our genome, uh, over 90% in fact, we see that they already start living in groups. Um, but our brains, which are even larger, especially the prefrontal cortex, they have accomplished things like building cities, um, uh, driving cars and building airplanes and even um, sending a rover to Mars. Uh, there are additional considerations that come with living in these groups and they include moral emotions that have developed. Um, this is by a review by Ralph Adolfs in Nature Neuroscience um, basically saying that we are able to live in these complex societies and accomplish these complex things because of our brain that has evol evolved and developed and because of these moral types of emotions that have developed such as guilt, shame, embarrassment, jealousy, pride and other aspects that depend on the social context. The important takeaway message from this slide is that the evolution of these types of moral emotions which obviously is based on or comes from living together in larger groups is what has allowed the development um, of our societies in a sense. So emotions such as guilt and shame, they require a cognitive representation of the individual, so us, within a social context. And uh, this is com cognitively quite complex, also effectively. Uh, and they function to regulate social behavior in the long-term interest of the group and not the long-term interest of the individual. And this is really what enabled us to collaborate, to work together on complex com uh, projects. Uh, that basically are the foundation of our society. While absolute brain size does correlate with the social complexity that an animal exhibits, as can be seen from this ready, uh, from this correlation here, uh, it's a very rough estimate of, um, well, basically the, the capabilities of the brain. A better estimate, in fact, is relative brain size, which is the the brain weight relative to body weight. And you can see here that modern man is a bit of an outlier here, outlier based on this uh, on this plotting here. We don't have the largest brain, that would be the blue whale, um, and even the elephant or the purpoise, uh, who have larger brain, larger brains than us. Um, but we have the largest relative brain size. 
Uh, and that is basically saying that um, we're counting for all of these things that um, the brain does that we don't have to think about that do not require cognitive effort. So the brain has to take care of a much larger body. Um, and we're interested in the capacity that is left over after uh, accounting for the computing capacity that goes into taking care of the body's everyday physical needs. You can also see large differences in, in the anatomy of the brains. Even when we compare ourselves to, to um, apes and monkeys, uh, we have many more grooves and ridges in our brain, basically indicating that sometime, uh, some time ago in our evolutionary history, our brains outgrew the skull that it's in and the brain had to basically, the cortex had to fold in on itself building these grooves and ridges or sulca and gyri that you can see here at the outside of the brain. Um, a monkey brain is much smoother, for instance, uh, doesn't show as many sulca and gyri as the human brain. But still, we're in the domain of relatively rough estimates of, of uh, how brain size relates, relates to social intelligence. Um, a better estimate is probably to look at what uh, developed last in our evolutionary uh, development of our brain, namely the neocortex. So looking at the neocortex ratio um, we, and comparing it to mean group size, we can see that there is a correlation, um, especially when we look at, at monkeys and great apes. So based on this, we can see that as the neocortex ratio grows, so that is the uh, amount of brain tissue in neocortex relative to the rest of the brain, uh, we can see that the that the group size also grows. So this is quite a strong correlation. And this occurs both in monkeys and in great apes. Um, and from this, we can extract the number of people that we should be able to interact with given our neocortex ratio. And that should be somewhere in the order of 150. This is also what's called Dunbar's number. So we're basically extrapolating from the average human brain size based on the correlations that exist in other primates and, and even the ones that are quite closely related to us, such as chimpanzees here. We can also study this. So we can look at um, monkeys that are assigned to different group sizes um, and look at how the, um, well, the density of neurons in specific areas of the brain correlates with the group, uh, group size of other monkeys that these that these monkeys are housed with. So this is a this is an MRI study taking an anatomical scan of a monkey and then computing the, the neuronal density within each region and correlating this across monkeys with the um, with the number of uh, other monkeys that they're housed with in, in and and that they're living with basically. And what these researchers found, Saleh and and uh, colleagues, is that there is a network in the brain that seems to correlate with group size. So that's basically indicative that um, living in larger groups either is associated with uh, having a, a larger density of neurons in these regions. Those regions include the superior temporal sulcus. Um, those regions include also the amygdala, for instance, but the, the superior temporal sulcus here is uh, the most common region and the, the most important region to remember. So there's a relationship between um, the neural density in a region and the number of uh, monkeys that that uh, or the number of, of other animals that uh, a monkey is housed with, showing directly that, that this relationship exists. We can also study this in humans and there's a simple way of, of studying group sizes in humans and that is just basically looking at social media accounts. So this is an older study that looked at Facebook friends. Nowadays, obviously, this would be Instagram friends or some other social media account or platform. But this is a good proxy for how many friends people have. Um, and we can also see that even in humans, there's a similar correlation here between um, the number of friends or the group size that people are interacting with on, on a regular basis and in this case, the gray matter density. So this is voxel-based morphometry, um, basically also giving a reflection of the density of neurons in, in a given region. Um, again, the superior temporal sulcus shows up here, and that seems to be a consistent region that seems to be 
associated with the size of the group that um, we are living with. Now, this is actually a very interesting region and it's part of the visual social system. Um, so it's involved in social perception, in understanding other people's intentions, other people's movements, and so forth. Uh, so it's this area here, and this has been identified in monkey electrophysiology studies um, and summarized here in this, in this review. One way to see your own superior temple sockets in action is to have a look at this animation here. This is a link to an older experiment from the 1940s even. Um, so I want to give you a little moment to uh, have a look at this, maybe pause the video and uh, check out the Hydra and Simmer animation on, that is under this link. So I'll give you some time to pause now. So basically what this is showing is that we interpret even simple shapes moving in, in, certain, in a certain fashion on the screen as having some form of agency and maybe even having some personality. But you definitely, so what most people say about this animation is that there's a bully in there, uh, someone who is being bullied, and then a, and a third shape that is trying to help the bully, or to help the person that is being bullied, or the, the, the shape that is being bullied. It's not a person. Um, so basically showing that even when we're looking at something absolutely non-social, like shapes moving on a screen, it comes very easy to us to interpret this as a social context, um, as, as persons or people that have um, s sort of uh, desires or goals and that are trying to perform specific behaviors that, that have some social context and some social meaning. And this is something that is commonly done by this superior temple sulcus here. Now, this is exactly what was done in a number of early studies on the social uh, uh, system within the brain. Um, and what they found is a region in dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and the superior temple sulcus here that are engaged when these cartoons or similar cartoons were shown to participants in the scanner. Um, also intriguing is that when you compare um, the neural responses to, to these animations um, that elicit what's called mentalizing, so thinking about these types of intentions that, that these shapes might have. Um, when you do this in control participants, again, you find this superior temple sulcus activation. But when you do this in autism spectrum disorder patients, then you do not find these types of activations, showing basically that there is some abnormality in how um, a, a patient with autism seems to process these types of stimuli. And obviously this finding uh, at the neural level agrees with, with what we know about autism at the behavior level, uh, because autistic people do not show as much interest in, in social uh, stimuli. And um, therefore it comes as no surprise that they do not find these types of activation patterns um, in response to stimuli that are by nature not social, but can be interpreted as social stimuli. In fact, uh, autistic patients commonly describe simply the shapes and uh, not the social nature of, of the interaction of these shapes when looking at these types of videos. My point here is that the brain has adapted on every level to the social environment that we live in, including the perceptual level. Um, but obviously, while this starts at the level of perception, um, this penetrates or the, the fact that we consider social aspects of our, of our world, social context penetrates many other cognitive and effective processes.